Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session called Managing Production Amid Constant Requests for New Cloud Services. My name is Joe Goldberg. I'm a member of Control M Solutions Marketing. Uh, in this session, we're going to discuss the integrations that have been added to Control M over time and the reasons why these are so important. Now, um, to illustrate the challenge that companies are facing. Uh, there's a customer story that I'd like to share with you relating specifically to the need for integrations. Uh, there's a large manufacturer in the United States. Uh, they approached us uh, when they started moving a lot of their data related projects to Azure and uh, they inquired about integration with Azure Data Factory. Uh, as it happens, we were working on it at that time. We worked with them and delivered it. And uh, their data teams were very happy with the integration. They started using it. And of course, success breeds success. And their data team started asking for additional integrations for services on Azure. Um, Databricks, Logic Apps, uh, Synapse, uh, the list goes on. This scenario is one that we have seen play out over and over again. And it's quite understandable why this is happening. So if anybody is watching the cloud world uh, and the as a service world, which I'm sure all of you are, you're probably seeing something like this. And you know this is not meant for you to necessarily read, but these are the consoles of the three primary or the major cloud providers as well as a screenshot of what is the sort of a data ecosystem. And what this shows is the massive proliferation of services that have become available. Now, this has always been a challenge in the production environment. Uh, I think that we have consistently been asked about integration with this service, that service, some other service, but the pace has increased dramatically. Pretty much every organization that we talk to is either already on the cloud or thinking about the cloud or in the process of moving to a cloud. And even if they move to the cloud just for infrastructure, perhaps initially, uh, very soon after they start consuming a variety of services. And if you are a control M environment and if you have a production that's running applications over a very complex heterogeneous environment, then the need to add and integrate these services into that environment becomes very significant. And so we wanted to be able to, uh, to address that need. Now, what we did was, and this is not specifically uh, for Control M21, it started a little before Control M21 was released, but we created a dedicated integrations team. And that integrations team has now been delivering somewhere between two to four new integrations every single month. And so this is, um, you know, this slide, as soon as it's produced, pretty much is out of date. Um, but you can see that since the beginning of this calendar year, these are the integrations that have been delivered so far. And this pace of monthly integration, which is uncoupled from the specific versions of Control M continues. Uh, there are some minimum requirements. You have to be at Control M20 or above to consume these integrations. Uh, there's also these integrations. Most of them are also available for Helix Control M. But you can see the list and how significant this list has become just over the last year. And this pace will continue. So, um, what I'd like to do for the remainder of the time we have is talk a little bit about how you deploy or how these integrations operate. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail and we'll take maybe only one or two as an example. But of course, this is one of the great benefits of Control M and that is that these integrations really kind of function in a very, very similar kind of manner. Of course, the service or the application that you're invoking, <clears throat> excuse me, is a little bit different. Uh, each one requires maybe some little, you know, some parameters that are specific to that service. But the mechanism of how you deploy the integration, how you define what we call connection profiles, how security is managed, all of these things, uh, once we have built the foundation for the way we build these integrations, are all very much the, are very, very similar. 
And by the way, the, the basis or the technology that all these integrations are built on is something called Application Integrator. If you are a Control-M user, Application Integrator is a component of Control-M. It is a wizard-based, low-code way to construct integrations. And anything that the integrations team has not yet delivered that you may want to build an integration for either an application from a third party that we have not yet supported or an application that may have been written and created internally in your own environment, you can use Application Integrator in exactly the same way. So <clears throat> what are the kind of the steps? So first, all the integrations that I listed on the previous page, and again, these change uh, month by month. Uh, they are all available on EPD, and so you deploy them by first starting to download from EPD. If you go to EPD, which is Electronic Product Download, again, anyone who is familiar with or has been responsible for installing any control M components, you should be familiar with that. Um, of course, if you're not, you can go to bmc.com slash support. You'll get all the information that's required. Um, but you know, EPD is our sort of primary digital delivery vehicle for product distribution. So you download, uh, or sorry, you first go and find control M integrations. You'll see all the integrations I just mentioned. Download the one you want. It's a zip file. You unzip it and you deploy it using Automation API. We'll show you in a moment how that's done. Once you deploy the plugin, you construct a connection profile. Connection profiles contain the information the control M needs to connect to the application. And then finally, you just build and run your jobs like any other control M jobs. And once you deploy these integrations, you will see that whether you are using a graphical UI like the web UI, or whether you are familiar with or comfortable with the control M workload automation client, or you're using automation API in JSON or the Python client, you can build uh, those jobs for these integrations and services, just like any other job. So again, here's an example, a screenshot from EPD. You can see some of the list of uh, components here. You download it. Uh, as I said, you do the download, you do an unzip. There's a file called whatever the integration name, .ctmai, which is the format of the file for uh, application integrator. But that's part of the, the zip structure, and then you deploy it. And you can deploy it again, either using the CTM CLI that's part of Automation API, or you can just use RESTful Web Services or REST API directly if you're more familiar or more comfortable with that. So once you deploy it, you can start using it. And now I'd like to switch to a live environment, and let's take a look at how you would actually uh, take advantage of these kinds of integrations. So we have here a Control M, Control M21 uh, environment. And not all of the integrations, but a bunch have been installed and deployed. And so before we start looking at how we actually build jobs, let's take a look at some of the integrations that are deployed here and some of the functionality. Now. One of the other things that I, I didn't mention, but I'm, I'm going to point out as we talk about this, is I think I mentioned that there's sort of fundamental or foundational capabilities that were required that really apply to almost every single cloud service, and that is security. Now, uh, we'll touch on the different flavors of security, but you should just be aware that we are, today, we support uh, not only sort of a user and password kind of mechanism, and again, each cloud vendor has a different nomenclature and how do they, de they describe that, uh, but we also support the cloud security, which allows you to really kind of remove control M from the business of having to manage credentials. We'll see those as well. Okay, so let's start by also examining the agents. Again, as I said, this is a very modest environment. There's one agent on Azure and one agent on AWS. The mechanisms for other clouds, such as Google, are exactly the same, but I wanted to be able to, to kind of give you at least a flavor for what are the options that are available. So if we look at our Azure uh, agent, it is running on an Azure VM. If we take a quick look at what that Azure VM looks like, 
the thing that is significant about this Azure VM, uh, by the way, this is the Azure portal. If you're not familiar with it, that's okay. But um, this is sort of the, some of the considerations for how you install and what are the considerations for how you would configure and manage uh, integrations on Azure that want to take advantage of what's called managed identities. Okay, so we can see in the uh, definition or the characteristics of the Azure VM, there is something called a user assigned uh, managed identity and you can see the name of it here. If you then go and take a look at what you want to access, we're going to run some data factory jobs. So we'll see what that looks like. But one of the things about this data factory is if I look at the access control and see who has access to this resource, you will find that in the list is that managed identity that is associated with the Azure VM on which my agent is running. And what that is going to allow me to do is to tell Control M that I don't have to give you any credentials, use the credentials of the machine that the agent is running on and inherit them that way. So you, uh, from an administrative perspective, don't have to manage those credentials. So now if we go back and take a look at, uh, let's say an Azure service, like um, an Azure function, okay? So again, you will see that most of these connection profiles are very similar and they're certainly from for each cloud, all of the integrations of the services within that cloud are pretty similar. Um, so you specify some characteristics, subscription ID is kind of like defining my environment in Azure. And then you can see that I have two flavors available in identity type. I can either choose service principle or managed identity. Managed identity is what I just showed you is like saying, I'm not gonna, for control M, don't expect any credentials to be in the connection profile. Instead, rely on the credentials that the agent can inherit by virtue of the fact that it is running on a VM or an Azure VM that has already associated with it a managed identity. If I select service principle, then I would have to provide what is basically a username and password service principle or an app registration is, is a, a term or an object within Azure that has kind of a name or it's kind of a complex number and associated with what's called a client secret, which is kind of like a long complex password. Um, and then you would have to provide and manage that in your connection profile. So if your client secret changes from time to time, and by the way, of course, Azure recommends that you do change and and uh, sort of cycle through client secrets on a regular basis, you would have to update your connection profiles. By using managed identity, you can skip that process. Okay, so you can see managed identity, there's really no other information that I need to give control M because by virtue of running on a machine that has a managed identity associated with it, that's how the security will provide be provided for the control M jobs. This is true for Azure DF. So we saw the data factory or Azure data factory, uh, again, also managed identity. Uh, and the same kind of approach is taken with the other clouds. So for example, Glue, which is an AWS service, if you happen to to be using AWS instead of, or in addition to Azure VM. Uh, if you want to run Glue, which is kind of an ETL service available on uh, AWS, I have the option of selecting IAM role as the authentication mechanism. And IAM role in AWS is kind of equivalent to managed identity in, um, in Azure. So let's take a quick look at um, the AWS console. So you can see this is the machine, and I'll show you momentarily uh, that this is the machine that I'm running on or in the AWS space. And you can see that it has an associated IAM role, which you can see here. And so that is what I am going to refer to in my connection profile, saying that that's the IAM role that I am expecting. Uh, and you know, there's various ways to modify that, but I am not going to provide any uh, access key or secret key ID, which is kind of the equivalent of a username and password. 
because I don't want Control M to have to deal with managing those uh, those credentials. Instead, I'm going to rely on the agent. Okay. Okay. So that's an example. And by the way, in Google Cloud, just for completeness sake, there's something called service account or default service account, which can be associated with a machine that runs or a VM that runs in uh, GCP. Now, these cloud services do require that the machines that the agent is running on are deployed in that cloud. So it has to be either a Google Compute Engine VM, or it has to be an Azure VM or an AWS EC2 instance, if you want to use managed identity. If you either don't want or cannot have an agent running on those kind of machines, then you can use the other um, authentication mechanisms. Okay, so once we have built uh, all of these different connection profiles, we can start building our jobs. And actually, before I go there, let me just quickly bounce back over here to show you that what I have are uh, an agent on Azure, which is this machine called AZ something, as I showed you before. And the EC2 instance that we looked at before is the one that's running on AWS. Okay, so let's take a look at this scenario where we have a whole bunch of different services that are uh, that we want to be able to integrate with. Now, chances are you're not going to have a single workflow that's going to have all of these uh, services from a whole bunch of different clouds. This, of course, is constructed for an example. But um, the intent here is to show you how these jobs look and how similar they are uh, what are some of the things that you may want to consider when you combine them with some of the other features and capabilities that have become available in Control M21 uh, very recently? Okay, so here is our data factory job. Um, notice it is using the connection profile of Azure DF. There are a couple of things that you have to then specify to tell Control M which in turn relates to how Control M interacts with Azure about the data factory that you want to run. Uh, the things that are required in, ad in addition to the connection profile, again, this is specific to a data factory, is something called a resource group, which is an Azure object, and then the name of the data factory, and within the data factory, the name of the pipeline. If we quickly switch back to the Azure portal, this is the data factory that we are looking at. And if I look at the overview, we can see that the resource group is here. So I get the information from there. The other information is gotten, well, either I already know the name of the data factory, so that's something I would have to provide. But if we take a look at what an Azure data factory looks like, in case you're not familiar with the Azure portal, um, let's take a quick look at what we're actually going to be running. So here is a bunch of, well, a couple of pipelines that I've constructed, and there's one very simple one. This is the one I'm going to run. I have some more complex pipelines, but this is what I want to run, and I will accomplish that with the job definition that you see here now before you. So you can see the resource group, you can see the data factory, and the name of the pipeline. If this pipeline had some input variables, I would be able to provide them here in the parameters section, but I don't have any, so I won't. Uh, I don't need to provide anything here. If we take a look at another job for another integration, so this is Azure Synapse. Again, another service, um, also quite similar to Data Factory, has some slightly different functionality used by different of folks for slightly different functions, but I have a connection profile. I think we quickly browsed it. Um, but in addition, again, I have a pipeline name and some parameters. So this one is even simpler. Notice, however, that I am running this on that VM, or sorry, on that agent, which is an Azure VM. Um, and if I go back to the Azure Data Factory, you can see that as well. If I were to run this on a different machine, I could do that, but the connection profile would have to provide credentials that were not tied to the machine of the agent 
And so I would need a different connection profile. Before we get too much further along, there's one other thing that I'd like to mention, and this is a feature, well, there's a couple of features that are embedded in this workflow that are um, unique to Control M21, and I think they're, they're kind of important. Um, one is, well, actually, you know what? Let me order this because, oops, because I think we want to run this and see how it runs. So we'll look at it in an execution. Um, and I'll talk about this as we go. So the first thing is what you have just seen here. It says that run is partially succeeded because I have a job here that only runs on certain days and it's not scheduled for today. Um, so you can see what the flow construction looks like. There's some dependencies on this particular job. And typically, if this job was not here, before Control M21, you would have to perhaps either have a, a different flow or you would have to handle it some other way. If we uh, switch very quickly to our monitoring and look at how that job ran, or that flow ran, rather, um, we'll see that it was constructed and the job was logically removed and all of the conditions for this flow to execute were kind of reconstructed and reconnected by control M automatically. Um, this is a feature called bridge that you may have seen in control M21 discussions previously, but this together with another feature, which is this reference folder allows greater flexibility among teams so that you can have, let's say, a separate team responsible for their workflow, and you can include, in effect, or embed their workflow in yours without having to know much about it. So if I go back to planning and uh, very quickly just take a look at how this appears, you can see this is called a reference folder. The way this is constructed is by checking the reference checkbox. And now I can have a completely separate team that could build and manage this workflow. And then I can just simply embed it in my workflow and using a combination of this and the bridge mechanism, that other group can construct whatever kind of scheduling is required for their workflow without necessarily impacting my workflow, without me having to reconstruct or be dependent on the jobs that they have created. So we only have a couple of minutes left, and this was really intended at a very, as a very quick flyby. Um, but uh, I think at this point, I would like to just check very quickly if we do have any mess, uh, sorry, any questions that have come in over chat meanwhile. Um, it seems like we do not. So I do have a couple of minutes maybe to spend uh, on a couple of other things just to mention some of the capabilities that have been added in Control M21 that are, I think, interesting in the context of uh, integration. So when we looked at centralized connection profiles, um, there's a couple of others that are of interest. So uh, these are really in an MFT concept. In a con uh, more in a context of MFT and file transfer, but still are cloud services that have become available in Control M21. Um, so Azure Cloud Storage or Blob Storage was supported as of Control M20 fixed back 200, but in Control M21, uh, we have added support for what is called Azure Data Lake Storage. And if you look at the connection profile here, again, if you look at the storage types, um, you can have Azure storage, sorry, you can also see that Google storage, of course, in S3, which is AWS storage, has been supported, and the storage subtype is either conventional blob storage or, uh, again, as of Control M21, data lake storage. There's also similar support has been added for all of the other um, or many of the other storage types, including an S3 support for what's called private link. Um, okay, so I see that there is a, uh, a 
a question. I'm not sure. The question that is being asked is, uh, do how much longer do we need to use CCM? Um, so everything that I have done here, of course, is through the web UI. And you can see that you can continue or you can use the web UI instead of the CCM. So I'm not question. I'm not sure if the question is asking how much longer we are forced to use CCM or how much longer we will still have CCM. Um, uh, so, and uh, I guess the follow-up question is how much of the functionality uh, will be uh, available via auto automation API instead of via CCM. So um, I think that that is a work in progress. Uh, of course, if you've been watching, it's kind of interesting to have a, maybe a question as to what version of Control M you're using right now or the person that asked the question. Um, there is now, I don't know what the percentage is, but a very, very significant portion of the CCM capability is available uh, via automation API and also certainly via the web UI. Um, but you know this is a version by version kind of a, a of an effort that has been ongoing for a while and the intent is of course to eventually I think retire all of the thick client uh, the thick clients both for uh, job management monitoring as well as administration and um, you know, I certainly would urge you to take a look at Control M21. Um, there's lots of new capabilities that have been added into the web UI and the automation API component, of course, is modified and, up and enhanced on a monthly basis, uh, completely separate from Control M releases. So um, I think at this point, we will call it, uh, I think I will just end at this point and say that, um, my contact information, by the way, is joe underscore goldberg at bmc.com. Uh, you feel free to contact me with any questions that you may have that we didn't get a chance to discuss or answer in the session. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event.